Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're from or at currently or coming in. Welcome to the Studio Q Live Show. My name is Quinn Jacobson, coming from a beautiful Sunday morning in De beautiful Denver, Colorado, metro area. Um, what do we have today? Sunny and 34 degrees Celsius, 90, 92, or 93 degrees, something like that. Um, I know this isn't the uh, broadcast we decided to jump in on, but I'm going to go pop this over here. And uh, they have discontinued um, Hangouts, interestingly enough. So I have to do a little work around here, but it should be okay. Go over to face bag here. Let's do this thing. Let's see if we can get some people in here. I'm live. Go. So. All right. Um, we just wait. There's Jean. Come on in. Where's your video feed? That's why I'm doing this, so we can kind of interact. I don't like to be one-sided here. Um, welcome. Boom. So we're going to try to cover a little bit of ground this morning. I thought it was interesting. Um, Krister from Sweden. Um, talked about uh, talked about um, the different recipes here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna address that when we get some people in here. Two minutes. I know we're early. I know a lot of Europeans. I know a lot of people are on holiday. I get all that stuff. I understand. Um, uh, just. Be patient. We'll get there. I'm going to download. Uh, there's this open broadcaster software. Um, I'm going to try to implement some of that too, just for the simple fact of making recording these a lot easier. I don't have to depend on Google or YouTube or any of that stuff, which can be a pain because you never know what you're going to get. Let's see, where are we? Installer package. Oh. Okay. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Oh, anyway. Oh, God. Here we go. So I hope everybody's doing well out there. We're uh, I'm I'm uh, I've been bladesmithing this morning actually. Uh, extra points for anyone that knows what a San Mai construction and bladesmithing is. I'm doing a San Mai. The railroad spike that I found on a massacre site was close to a. Cottonwood Plains tree that I have you see in the Fox jaw image in the chemical pictures, but That piece of Cottonwood Plains tree I cut up and I'm making Handle scales for this railroad spike knife that I made and then I'm gonna make two pot prints or one pot print I haven't decided yet actually and put the knife with a pot print where it came from and do a little uh, piece like that That should be interesting. I think it will be anyway I'm gonna open this OBS up while we allow people to string in here. Uh, Facebook, YouTube. Let's see, start, start recording. Um. You don't have any, oh, okay. I 
I do video capture. Let's see if that does it. I'm not really sure. Uh, oh, start streaming. Oh, it is recording. Question is, is it recording what we want? All right, John, I don't know what's going on. We'll wait a few more minutes. I'm not going to waste my time if we don't have anybody come in. I'm going to... I have stuff to do. So if we don't have, maybe it's the right, wrong time of year, right? The um, holiday season, people are gone for the summer holidays and people are busy. I get it. I get it. But it'll give me a chance to try this out. Um, video capture device. I don't know why. Hmm. Device. Oh. Oh, there we go. Oh, good. Um, does that work? So, uh, window capture, video capture device, window capture. That's a good question. Let's see. I don't know if this is capturing all this. Wow. Okay. Well, you know what? Um, I'll give it. I'll give it until twenty after. And we'll see what happens. I know people are. Wow. Interesting. I'm playing with this OBS software. I'm trying to figure out. Yeah. Cool. That looks good. I like it. I'm going to see what it does, where it records and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, people just don't know what's happening, do they? Let me go see if I can round somebody up here. People may just be too damn busy for this stuff, you know? Too white, too dispersed, too... You know what I'm going to try? Jean, hey. I'm going to pop over to Facebook. I'm going to do a live feed on Facebook. Join me over there if you can. Um, what do we have going on here? There's not nine per... There's, oh. Oh, is this... Okay, here we go. Good morning. Oh, man. Um. Yeah, <laughs> you know what happened, guys? I went in to set this uh, Hangout up, and it says start live broadcast now. It had a button there. Went in there half an hour ago, and it says Google Hangouts no longer available uh, at the link in the Facebook site. Yeah, you know what? I wonder if we can scare them over here. Um, I'm going to go. Uh, let me let me grab. Let me see if I can grab them. I'll be right back here. Um, Let's see if I can go to uh, chemical pictures. Um, watch now. Yep. And I tweeted that out. So let me see if I can get a couple more people in here and we'll do it.
and put it here. And Chris, are we going to address that? That's a great uh, question you're bringing up there. In fact, I'll just read that right now. I've compared the recipes of QC positive and the new 2019 compared to the old one. There you go. Thanks, John. That's good. Um, let's read this from Krister here. I've compared the recipe of QC positive and the new 2019 compared to the old one. When I do this amount of ethanol and ether is about 23% less now. That's correct. I assume, hey, Marcus, let's see if we can get that in there. Um, if you look at page 98, let's look at that. Running page 98 right there. Developer suite, yeah. Look at trouble the, uh, the drain loading by adding 20% one to one ether alcohol to avoid ridges is just mentioned as a comparison to that concentration could be changed unintentionally. Yes, what happens, so my question is, do you adapt the amount of ethanol and ether to your local temperature and humidity? Yes, I do. However, uh, and yes, it's you're, you're correct about that. However, you've got to, and Chris is right here. Let's see, let me come back to the page. Um, I, hope, I hope we can get some people now. Um, let me come back to the page and address this. So, On Facebook is not the good one. Yeah, we reposted and you did too. So, well, they'll come in. If they come in, they come in. There's Marcus. Um, so here's a question. Let's talk about solvents. We might as well start with this, right? Um, what what do solvents do in the process? Um, first, off, first off, the alcohol, um, it, they're solvents, right? So alcohol and ether is what we're talking about. Um, the problem... A lot of times, uh, one of the reasons I drop that by 20% is that's a rough estimate of uh, of what you lose during this. Uh, and depending on the size of the plates and the temperature and humidity, right? The amount of, of solvent you lose pouring plates. That's why we use a drain bottle. Remember, we have, a, we have this uh, mass, a very volatile, especially the ether, coming off the plate when you pour the plate. And... And so the, the, here, here's a good example. So the difference between solvents in this pour bottle versus this drain bottle, I reckon is 20%. I think is about 20%. Now that's pouring plates, whole plates, half plates, six by six, 15 centimeter plates um, for an entire 200, let's say 200 milliliters into, uh, th well, this is 125. So let's say 125. After you pour 125 milliliters of clothing out on a surface that's going to allow those that to evaporate, especially the ether, not so much the alcohol. There's a little bit of that, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, you have to replenish that. So if you don't use a drain bottle and you, you drain back into your pour bottle, eventually, and especially where I live here, eventually you're going to have like gum. It's just going to be thick. It's uh, the... Um, very viscous, very thick, very uh, rubber-like, if you will. It, it can get really extreme. A quick story about the solvents and collodion. I went, um, when I first moved here to Colorado from Europe, um, it was shortly after that, I, uh, I did um, a workshop at uh, about 4,000 meters uh, above sea level, uh, 14,000 feet, more or less. And the first test run that I did up there is I went up to about 11,000 feet, feet. It's called Squaw Pass, 3,500, 3,200 meters, something like that. And, um, and I brought my regular chemistry in my cooler, set up my dark box. I did this like landscape scene, whatever, mountain, Rocky Mountain, mountain scene, right? And I went to pour the plate and just the lack, just the pressure and the elevation changed the consistency of my collodion right away. So I ended up having to add about 30 to 40% more solvents to go to those elevations. It, it was bizarre. And then I went up to all the way to the 14,000 foot level where it's, you'll, you'll feel that your oxygen, you know, 
when people move to these high altitude locations, what happens is our body adapts by creating more red blood cells because there's less oxygen in the air and we need oxygen, right? And, and so if you come from a low elevation, like I did from Germany, you know, basically sea level, and you, you move to eight or 10,000 or 12,000 feet, 14,000 feet, 4,000 meters, 3,000, 4,000 meters above sea level, your body needs time to adjust. Air so thin of oxygen that your body produces more red blood cells so you can take in more oxygen. Not that that has anything to do with solvents and collodion, but that tells you at these, these higher elevations, these compounds change. And, and your methodology needs to change too, and your recipe mixing needs to change. Here's the bottom line, Krister. The only thing, uh, and, and it's a great, I'm, I'm glad you, you saw that. Um, it's basically just a swap, and it's not really, to be honest with you, um, you start out with a low amount, uh, 20%, like you said, 23%. Uh, a smaller amount of solvents. The ether is kind of irrelevant, not completely, especially if you use anhydrous ether, meaning there's no water in that ether. Um, the alcohol, the alcohol has 95% ethanol and 5% water. Now, 5% water can be a problem with collodion. Um, I know people always say, oh, I make this uh, no eth additional ether collodion, it's fine. I made a few batches substituting the ether for alcohol. Now you're raising that water content in your collodion up to where the chambered lines, the crepey lines, the 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 the, the ridges, the um, uh, not the ridges, sorry, the crepey lines, the, um, the the weakness, the that's what I was thinking, the emulsion, the collodion itself becomes very very fragile. You can't run a cotton ball over it. It's it's very weak because of that water. Um, the old primary literature talks about water being very injurious to collodion. So you don't want an excess of water. So one of the reasons I changed that up a little bit is I cut that back. But if you use a pour in a drain bottle, and I would imagine you do if you're following this book anyway, you're gonna add that right back in. It's not going to change it. It's gonna bring it back up to that, that volume. But that's a very, very good question. So why don't you recommend recipes with, without ether adding? I do. Uh, I, I, you mean without adding alcohol? Well, I, I don't understand the question. Um, I recommend collodion, raw plain USP collodion has um, plenty of ether in it. 20, um, to, uh, what's the total to say on ether? It, it's, it's high. It's 20, 30% ether, right? And then alcohol and nitrocellulose. That's what's in plain USP collodion. We add both alcohol and ether to that plain USP collodion to do two things, to thin it out so you can pour it on the plate and to keep it wet as long as you can and for adherence. Ether, ether helps adherence for the, the collodion to stick to the plate. So I do not recommend these recipes where you see taking ether out of the equation and only adding uh, substituting alcohol. Unless you absolutely can't get ether, there's no reason why you should be afraid of ether if you store it right and you manage it right and you mitigate the peroxides. There's no reason why you shouldn't, um, you know, use ether. I'm, I'm really kind of surprised. But there's a lot of people that can't get 95% alcohol. There's a lot of people that can't get ether. There's a lot of people that can't get cadmium nitrate or cadmium bromide. There's a lot of people that can't get uh, um, potassium cyanide. So a lot of these components that I use, the, the, the way I like to make photographs and how I make photographs, maybe it's not possible for everyone everywhere. Hard to get ether legally in France. You know, that's really strange you say that because uh, I spent a lot of time in Paris, a lot of time, a couple of years, and I'd just walk to the pharmacy and buy six, six liters of ether. Very inexpensive, no problem easy to do, right? Um, I'll try something here. Let me, hold on guys. Let me, let me show you something. This is for Jean. He, Jean's always around. So I'm going to play this for him. I think, let me find this. See if I can share the screen anyway. Mm, let's see. 
Um, let me go through here. I have a bunch of them. So give me just a second to find this. And I'll scrub to the portion I want to show you. I might get a kick out of it. <laughs> so many videos, Quinn. So many videos. Ah. I could never be one of those YouTuber. I, I I mean, I enjoy videos, but man, it's, it's just so much work. So much work. Hmm. Making, let's see. I got to share this with you because I think it's just too good not to share. There it is. Okay. So I found this. Now let me go in and find the part that I want to play. Uh, oh, there it was right there. A nitrous, a nitrous SC. And at the origin, the laboratories of photography at the, at the start of the last century, it was the pharmacy. Very nice. Yeah, makes complete sense to me. Yeah. Maybe yeah. not to a digital photographer, but to me, it makes complete sense. Yeah. I will give you a product. Thank you very much. Can I share my screen? I thought I could share my screen. This is, this is important that it's plain USP non flexible clothing. Let me just see. This is flexible or non flexible clothing? Flexible or non flexible? Uh, the flexible clothing has oil, castor oil. Yeah. The non flexible is what you we use in photograph. You want yes, non flexible clothing. Damn, you guys can't see this, can you? That's the only way we can use it in clothing. Okay, well, this is me in a in Paris. This is strange. And anyway, go go to Vimeo and search uh, photographic heritage and watch me go into this uh, pharmacy. That's how I always did it. It's not possible anymore. Ether is only on prescription. Oh, really? Okay. Well, there you go. Big Brother's watching out for you, right? Wow. Yeah, you know what, guys? I fear someday this process isn't going to be available or legal to do, and it's kind of not already in a lot of places, um, which is kind of a, a sad deal is this kind of movement cracking down and Big Brother watching you. In fact, um, to my knowledge, I'm the only guy in, in this country, or at least in this part of the world, that can have potassium cyanide sent to my house. So I, I start up... Uh, I start up, uh, get, you know, that's a problem for people because it, it becomes a problem. Yes, come on to Denver, man. You'll never regret it. The best place in the world to live. That's why I live here, right? I mean, and now next year I'm moving to the mountains. So that's going to be even better. And you can get anything you want in the mountains. It's totally legal. But yeah, that's the caveat. Like uh, Marcus says, there's a lot in the U.S. here that um, will get, grant you the leeway if you're a business, not a a private individual. I mean, you can't get uh, you can't get um, e uh, cyanide or ether or any of that stuff sent to you as a private individual. Well, maybe ether you can, but yeah, laws are changing. It's a great conversation to have. Um, I know we're we're supposed to be talking technical here, and we will. But what would you guys do if all of a sudden um, you couldn't buy collodion legally? What would you do? Would you change processes? Would you leave collodion? Would you do it illegal? illegally what what would you guys do um i've had a couple of people ask me this before like in the past um <laughs> robert robert kalman denver marijuana is legal cyanide is legal yes you know what robert adulthood is legal in the state of colorado you can actually it's legal to be an adult there you can act like an adult you can have your freedom like an adult um it's it's bizarre how uh how uh, how adulthood things that adults may choose to do not harming other people but yes cannabis is legal here um, cyanide is legal yes if uh, if you're in a position like me um, cyanide is very legal to have just like everyone wants to talk about cyanide but no one ever talks about uh, cadmium bromide the absolute most dangerous compound in the process and ether isn't uh, a walk in the park either. 
Um, remember the 1920s and 30s in this country, in America, there were a lot of medical doctors addicted to huffing ether, right? So, yes, that's the fear here. Exactly. I know. I know what you mean, John. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's a real possibility, especially in the European Union. Um, as I look at those laws changing, um, that could be that could be a realistic thing, and that would be an absolute shame. That would be, uh, you know, when you take your material, when they take your materials away or make them illegal for the general public or for public safety or whatever laws these bureaucrats come up with. Um, it, it definitely uh, uh, would affect um, if they did that here. I don't see it happening here. Uh, um, maybe I'm naive, but I see it happening in other countries or potentially happening in other countries. Uh, just like you just told me ether. I, I walk in and walk out with boxes of ether, 12, 12 bottles of ether under my arms like this, right? For, you know, 80 euros or something, 100 euros or something like this. It was ridiculous. Um, when I was in Budapest, I could, uh, you know, I think a liter, I remember buying a liter of ether. I still have the bottle from Budapest in there. I bought a liter of ether for something for, uh, equivalent of seven euros or something. It was ridiculous. Even in the most dark shops in Poland, they don't want to discuss KCN. That's true. Yeah, you guys have insurance for your visit. Here in America, you have to. So if you're dealing with the public or you're like I'm, I do public demonstrations. I do all kinds of stuff. I have people in the studio working. I have to have it. Yeah, I do. Maybe that's a difference too. Yeah, there, there's there's some things, and you know, you're know, you going to vary from country to country there in, in the EU. I mean, Italy's going to have one thing. Germany's going to have another. Austria's going to have another. France is going to have another. I mean, it's you know this. It's all over the place and seems to be getting worse, actually. So... It's an interesting question to pose and think about. If these compounds were to go away, what would you do? Um, um, if I literally couldn't get these compounds, I, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I just, there's there's a lot of reasons why I use this process. And, and just, you know, I've reiterated this a million times, but in a nutshell, it's to support my work. I, I have so much invested in the materials and metaphors and meanings and everything. Um, it just wouldn't work for me. I'm not a one-off non-narrative image maker. So I don't have, I work on projects. I mean, yes, I do one-off stuff and teach and do commission stuff and all that stuff. But for my personal work, my projects are all, you know, 54 plates from Ghost Dance sitting over there. I have a few here, but 22 were edited down. I mean, if I didn't have the liberty to make a large body of work and select and edit down and the materials to do that, I... I, just, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't work in photography. I'd probably, what would I do? I'd, I'd just do bladesmithing. That's that's another passion. I, they, I don't think they can take any of that away from me. I Unless they stop selling. Well, they can't, um, e even if I had to get coal. So anyway, um, so yeah, what were we talking about? We were talking about the ether and alcohol in collodion and Christer raising the point of why did they change? It didn't really change it, it. It did change. You're right. It did change. I did drop the solvent solutions down. Um, and But we we put it back in when we rehydrate. Watercolor is our salvation. There you go. Yeah, you can paint. Um, you can do charcoal. You can draw. You can do those kinds of things. So it might not have that similar look. I, I'll tell you one thing that I was doing this morning, guys. This is kind of interesting, I think. Um, speaking of what would you do if uh, clothing was no longer available, which is, uh, wow, it's a scary uh, prospect, but I think it might come to fruition in some of these countries. Um, this morning, I, I get up early in the morning and I, I like to go out to my forge and, and work on things. This morning, I had a, a, uh, an old railroad spike that I found on the site of... Um, I'll show you. I found, I'll show you where I got both of these. Um, there's the first one. But I found this. I found this uh, spike where th on this site, um, there, there, this is two tracks running east and west. This is where they shot the buffalo from. 
Um, they just go out and just thrill kill buffalo along the eastern and the eastern plains out here. And I was looking around, and and we always looked on these massacre sites and these places that all this stuff happened. We looked for objects, plants, things like that, different metaphors. And I found a, an old, old spike, an old railroad spike. Um, I know it's over 100 years old. I can't tell exactly how old it is, but it's over 100 years old. And uh, and I took that spike yesterday, and I split that spike, and I, I bifurcated it. So the spike, it's I left the head, right? The spike comes out. I split the head like this, and I put a piece of uh, high carbon steel in there, 1095, and I tack welded it. And then I forged forged that high carbon steel in with that mild steel, and I forged a blade out of it. I extended the handle a little, little bit. I left the knob on it. And now this morning, I was just uh, fixing it up so I can put handles on it. And I'm going to drill holes through that spike, and I'm going to put um, handles on it from this cottonwood plains tree. I, I I found a piece of this tree. Um, the Native Americans used that for teepee, teepee poles and in sacred ceremonies, the cottonwood plains tree was very, very uh, uh, special to them. So now you have this railroad spike knife, high carbon edge on it, right? I'm gonna etch it so you'll be able to see the difference between the mild steel and the high carbon steel. And the railroad spike attached to that is a knife and the cottonwood plains tree handle on it and I'll stain it and all that. And then I'm going to make a pot print of either that image or where the spike came from, maybe both. And I put, I'm going to put that as kind of a three-dimensional or a, a installation piece, and I may do some of this kind of work. So I, I, that's, uh, that's why this process is so important to me. When do you increase the amount of eth ethanol and ether? You increase the amount of ethanol and ether when you have – uh, temperatures, humidity, and or elevation change. In other words, uh, collodion is going to be less viscous and higher in altitude. It's going to be more viscous in lower altitudes and warm weather. Um, um, it, you've got to be really careful of adding that water in. That water can, it, uh, you see these chambered lines on images. You, you can just see there, it's usually in the summertime. People have a lot of water in their collodion. Uh, they either added too, too much water in the initial salts dissolving or um, they've added too much alcohol, right? I mean, you you know, it's never really the question of increasing um, unless you do, unless you actually come to a hotter, drier, higher place. Um, it's it's more really decreasing a lot of the times. It's That's really where you want to go. And what I, we talked a little bit about this. What are the solvents for? The, the alcohol... Um, it has that little tiny bit of water in it, but the ethanol is what we're most interested in. The uh, ether, the hopefully anhydrous ether, anhydrous meaning without water, helps with the evaporation and the adhesion, and the uh, the alcohol is acts acts as a vis, uh, um, you know for viscosity for for thinning out basically, right? It's a true solvent. The alcohol does some of that too, but it actually seals off and hardens um, uh, as it evaporates. So you, you got to be careful on adding increasing ethanol and ether unless you're going from, again, your drain bottle and reconstituting that. You know what I do? I have this here. I think I showed you this last time. This is 50% ethanol and 50% ether. And that way I get to stabilize my ether with the alcohol. Alcohol stabilizes ether, meaning it can't form peroxides. And it, although I do have these, it, 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 this is ether, right? So this is five liters of um, diethyl ether. Um, so this is, uh, this is stored in a dark, cool place. But if you really want to stabilize it, just add some ethanol to it. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here real quick. Let's get some questions up. What, what kind of questions do we have here? Get, throw some questions out there, guys. Give me some question. Preguntas, fragas, you know, those kinds of things. I can't find the link. Oh, um, Dale just asked to jump in here. Marcus is in here. Ditto. Oh, sorry. Sorry, guys. I'm over here rambling and uh, 
you guys can't get in here. Maybe maybe they found their way. Ignore this if you guys have found your way in here. I'm sorry. I every time I think I have this scored away, I don't. So let's go. Let's get some questions rolling in here. Um, John put that link out there. People should be able to find that. So let's get some questions going. Um, good deal. Okay. So we uh, last time, last week, uh, I talked about doing something in Chapter 11, and I do want to talk about that briefly. I just I, – I know I reiterate a lot, but you know what? I, I, even as much as I reiterate, people still say, well, I didn't hear you say that. You know, yeah, I did. I just kind of, you know, got mixed mixed up in the shuffle here. So if you go to, we're going to start this again. If you go to page uh, 131, uh, we talked about what a negative is and what it needs to be. Um, does ether can make collodion more resistant? I don't know what you mean by that. I don't understand the question. Does ether make collodion more resistant? Yeah, throw it out there. Ether does the ether does have a, you know, let's call collodion is nitrocellulose, right? That's what when the solvents evaporate away, what you're left with is nitrocellulose. And nitrocellulose is basically a cotton. Jump in here, Marcus. What do you have to say? I love trays with a lid way more than tanks. Much easier. I I understand that. Uh, yeah, I understand that. You know what, Marcus? I'll, I'll give you the problem with trays. Uh, and I'll just throw this out here. And you guys take this conversation wherever you want to go with it. The problem with trays is that you have the plate laid flat, right? It's a tray. If it wasn't a tray, you'd have a tank. So you want a little bit of an incline. That's why you see these baths with a little bit of a 25, 30, you know, percent or 30 grade percent in, uh, grade here on the sl slant. The reason for that is, is when you push your plate down there on a dipper, you start this effect. And this thing runs for a few minutes. That the way that silver lays on the plate, it comes up and streams down, comes up and streams down. You can rock the plate in a silver bath, uh, a tray, no problem. And I tell people this: you don't have to spend a hundred euros on a tank or a hundred dollars on a tank. You can just use a nice, brand new, clean uh, tray. You have to have ridges in there. But the second part, the, okay, the good part about it is uh, in a tray, like Marcus is talking about you lessen the, the opportunity for those solvents to build up in your collodion. Um, and that's a good thing, right? The tank is closed up, you're constricted. So you have more opportunity for the solvents to build up each plate you put in there. Um, so that the tray portion is good for allowing the solvents to come up. The, the poor thing is, is the position of it. And you, you can still rock it, but then you have to kind of babysit it. And a lot of times I've seen so many people do this. I'm using the tray. I reach in and I scratch the emulsion all off of it. And I know you say, well, just take your time a little more and do all that thing and all that stuff. But people have a really hard time handling plates for some reason. Some people are asking or uh, uh, really uh, resistant to not, you know, they don't want to handle the plate so much with their hands. So they like dippers and they like, you know, that kind of thing. But so Trays are great. Just, you know, if, if you can, they're, they're not doable in the field. You know, if you're only working in, in here or something, that's great. But once you get out there in real life and start making plates, tanks are absolutely a must. Robert Kalman was shooting tin types in 90 degree weather yesterday. I kept both developer and clothing a cool chest filled with ice packs. Should I have also kept the silver bath cool? Um, Yes, exactly. He's and then asking because some plates were on the money and others were fogged. And here's the reason. Um, I've talked about this before. Heat exacerbates organic chemistry, right? You take it all the way down to that molecular level. Heat exacerbates all these actions. So if you have your developer and your collodion in a cooler, just like what I do, Robert, exact same thing, and you have ice blocks in there, whatever. Um, here's my methodology. 
if I head out, I'm, I got a two hour drive to my site or location, all my chemistry, including the silver bath, is in the cooler with the ice packs. And granted, this is summertime, all that. So when I get to location and I get set up, my silver bath goes into the tank and it's hanging out of my dark box. So now, now that I have great exposure, but now the ambient temperature is going to start warming that silver bath up. And if I keep the developer back and forth and clothing back and forth in the cooler to pour and then develop, those temperatures are going to remain in the, what, high 60s, mid 60s, maybe, maybe, you know, depending if it was 90 degrees where you're at yesterday, it probably didn't uh, stay that long. But your silver bath over time warmed up and that starts spinning everything up. So now when you put a, you pour a, a plate with nice cool collodion, you, you dump it in there. Now that heat difference, you might've even seen some finger spots, the, the, those radical heat differences, uh, temperature differences do some funky things to this metathesis or re, uh, um, double decomposition, right? Metathesis. When you put a plate in the silver bath, that action starts happening. We start exchanging ions. The cadmium bromide or your bromides and your iodides start talking to the silver nitrate and you get this double replacement. You have those two compounds left behind. If that spins up too fast, and especially from heat, you're gonna have plates that develop that when you pour the iron on the developer, that develop the unexposed silver along with the exposed silver. And that's what you were running into. Yeah, uh, what 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 plates were on the money and others were fogged? Was it random or was the first were the first plates good? And by the time you got to the end of your session, were they more veiled or unexposed silver process? How how did that go? Chime in there. Let us know. Tell us where they started going wrong. So negative. What is a negative? <clears throat> negative. Uh, a negative is a properly exposed photograph for printing. Um, <laughs> and you might say, well, you should reverse that and, and work from the positive. There are no positive images in this process. They're just That's just not happening. What you have is you have a piece of black material that you pour emulsion on, sensitize it, expose it, underexpose it, severely underexposed it, and then... Uh, have it on something black and use uh, reflected light to look at it. That's that's it's a very thin negative on black. If we if we wanted to be really honest about our positive images, they're very underexposed negatives on a black material or back with something black and use uh, reflected light. Negatives have much more density and they're used uh, looked at through with transmitted light because that's you're going to print onto paper. Okay, Robert says it varied late in the day after shooting a lot. The next to last plate was almost perfect. The last plate was wickedly fogged. Yeah, you know, I'd have to be there. People people send me these questions and it's like it's impossible for me to answer because I wasn't there and I don't know. But I do know the chemistry. I do know how heat affects the chemistry. And um yeah, exactly. That that's that, that that again, Krister, that's a similar situation, right? So my big thing is is trying to help people understand how the process works. And if you understand how the process works, you have some tools to go in and try to fix it, whether it's backing off. Yeah, you should yeah, you should keep the cool bath uh, the at silver the cool bath. You should keep that bath cool. Um yes, you should keep the silver bath the same ambient temperature, uh, the same temperature as your uh, developer and your collodion. Um, and really, uh, the most important are your silver bath and your developer, to be honest with you. But the problem is, is how do you keep your silver bath cool? I mean, you can, there's various things you can do. If you can put it back in your bath, if you, or back in your cooler between shots. Most people like me, I have a plan. I have a location. I drive to. I set up. I make ten plates. I break down and I leave. And I have a, you know, I work fairly fast. Um, uh, okay, two hours. It was night. It got up to ninety four in Sand Creek, ninety four degrees Fahrenheit, thirty four degrees Celsius. When I was at the Sand Creek massacre site, I made nine plates there in two and a half hours, and it was windy as all get up. Yes, you can put the tank right in the cooler. Absolutely. Yeah, 
Um, and if you want to be really in, uh, inventive or uh, really um, be creative, get one of those insulated wraparound bags and put it around your silver bath tank. I, I've, I've seen people do a lot of different things. Um, sometimes uh, those, those work great, but sometimes you're just in conditions that really collode in shouldn't be in. So no matter what you do, it's going to help too much. But yes, I think you, you should be able to make collodion photographs in 30 degree Celsius plus 30 to 35 degrees is pushing it. 40 degrees is absolutely insane, but uh, people do it and you can do it. That's 90 to hundred degrees Fahrenheit ambient temperature. People do it. One of the bigger problems is, is it's the heat, but if you add humidity to that, now you're in real problems. You're very welcome. Happy to have you, Robert. Um, so negatives are real photographs, quote unquote, and positives are thin negatives backed with something black. So that's that's really the difference between them. Why do you want these negatives? Um, why do you want these negatives so dense? Why wh when we talk about density or we talk about? Um, let me grab one of these. Okay, we'll do him again. When we talk about density and negatives, again, what we're talking about is the ability to shoot light through them, block certain areas on the paper, and let allow all the midtones to come through. So when you talk about these, you need to, there's that cottonwood tree piece. Of, that's what I cut up this morning, actually. When you talk about these, you need to be talking about them. They make terrible positives, by the way. You can see a little bit. If I turn it around glass side, you'll be able to see more of it. But they're terrible positives. Um, so negatives are a different animal. You can't use them necessarily. Um, you can't use um, positives or ambrotypes to print on pot paper. I, I said that a million times. It's density related. There needs to be enough buildup in the highlight areas, the midtones, and all the way to clear void areas of the glass to get show on that paper the true tonal range of the image. And these are these are really beautiful. Um, let me, let me go grab that one again. I, I know for you guys that didn't see it last time. Hold on. It's Ratch over here. Yeah. Remember this one from last week? I haven't, uh, <clears throat> Haven't done much to it. Remember that one? Here I am again, the same position. <laughs> so that is from that image. And again, you can start seeing what we're talking about when we talk about density and images. And uh, notice this too. Um, oh, by the way, I got an email from somebody the other or yesterday, I think it was, about, hey, I watched a colloidal chloride video and you don't show pour in the paper. And so there's a part one and part two up there in the video section now. So you can see this. Look at this one. I noticed that I didn't even cur fold the paper up. I just poured <laughs> collodion chloride out on the paper and let it go. You can do that too, no problem. So density of negatives, uh, the density of uh, the uh, what's on the glass, the amount of silver on the glass is going to determine if it's a good printable image or not. And of course, you need that good clear glass in your, your shadows or void areas. You need to see your finger through it or whatever. And then you need to have, uh, you know, depending on the type of print you're doing, you're, you need that density in the other places. What about redevelopment? Uh, page 135. What about redevelopment? Redevelopment is, uh, and you're going to hear different opinions about this, right? Uh, we don't get to talk about negatives a lot. I'd like to talk about negatives all the time. And I I mean, I love positives, but I, I don't have much interest in them anymore. I mean, I do, but not in this context. I'd rather make negatives and prints. Um, so let's talk about redevelopment. You're going to hear a lot of different um, ideas about, um, well, not a lot, a few different ideas about when you should redevelop an image or when you shouldn't or why you shouldn't. Very rarely do I pull a foundation negative on a site that I nail that exposure, everything was just right, the light, everything was perfect, the time of year, time of day. I mean, all these factors, right? I mean, we're on a ball that spins and turns and light comes in different, the temperature of light, the quality of light, the angles, everything changes. I mean, to take on a project that you're trying to communicate um, 
something, you you have to have the light cooperating with you to make negatives. So, so many times, no matter how many times I went out on some of these sites, the light, I, 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 I'd I wait, I'd come back a different time of year, I'd come back with foliage or no foliage, I'd come back, you know, it's a constant battle. So what redevelopment does for me is it allows me to make a solid negative, a good creep up to that ex perfect exposure that's X because we don't know what it is, and then take those last couple, three, four, five seconds, whatever it might be, and redevelop that plate, that glass plate, and build the density up to bring it into that perfect um, density for whatever type of print that I want to make. So obviously, you see that prints well on, on Clodium Pop. It'll print, it prints well on gelatin. It prints well on salt. It prints well on albumin. Um, it prints well on oil. I have a, wow, the oil print is crazy of it. Maybe I'll go grab that, but very dramatic, very incredible, very intense stuff. All of my negatives, well, 99.9999% of my negatives are redeveloped, at least to some degree, at least a splash to clean up and define the lines and just to give it that just punch, right? Uh, sometimes I only use 20 mils, just a real quick boom, on, boom, boom, on, off, three or four times. Sometimes I use 100 mils, you know, and, and really work that. If you have a super, if you make a properly exposed Ambro type and try to redevelop it to pop print it, it will not work. If, if all those parameters are set. If it's a true Ambro type, which is way, very, very underexposed, um, there's nothing there to cling on to. If you overexpose a little bit and you, you, you start plugging up those clear glass areas, the shadow and void areas, you have a tiny bit of uh, developed silver there you're going to redevelop and you're going to build that up. You're going to plug your whole plate up. There will be no glass areas. It won't print well. It won't look good. So there's uh, proper exposure, understanding what a negative is, understanding how to best achieve that, understanding the light, the optics, your chemistry, and then understanding how best to post-produce that. In other words, do you are you going to redevelop? Are you going to intensify? Are you going to do something else? What is your end goal? You need to know what your outcome is going, what your goal is or what your intended outcome is before you start over here, right? Because <clears throat> these are all based on what you want to do with that, that negative, based on where you, how you want to print it out or what you want to do with it. So redevelopment is, is, a, is huge. I mean, when people come here for workshops, they're really blown away by first, um, you know, making the first the chemistry is all a little bit different. Well, not all of it. The developer and the clothing is a little bit different. Um, higher iodides, uh, more, more acid, less iron in the developer, those kinds of things. Again, to get you closer to that goal. Um, but in, at the end of the day, these tools um, are extremely valuable. And, and when people come to workshops here, they see, oh wow, you, you you make you expose the negative for a time and a half, two times longer than a positive. We establish that because we make a perfect positive, right? A perfect tin type or ambro type, whatever. Then we time and a half or two times that, um, and then we go into development. And a negative can develop for you know a minute to three minutes, whatever. Um, I, I've always I've felt the good properly exposed negatives should develop with with your with good developer, a uh, negative developer, right around a minute should be perfect. You should you should be able to look at that and, and see everything you want to see in there. And then we go to redevelopment. So you, they get to see this, this progression uh, slowly but surely of building that density to the correct density that we want to print, which is the most sensitive step in redevelopment, iodine exposure or redevelopment. Great question, Krister. Really good questions. I appreciate you coming in here today and asking these things. <clears throat> Let's talk about what each of those do. The iodine, that dilute iodine, right? We take, uh, I've been using, I've been using this now. This tincture of iodine, it seems to work fine. They're, you know, they're like two US dollars or something. And I think I, I think I do one of those to a full liter of water. Anyway, it's a dilute 
solution of iodine. The cleaner the iodine you can get, the better. And you can show you how to make it too if you want to make it. You've got everything you need to make it doing collodion. But the iodine, what I'm going to ask you guys a question. I want you to chime in here on the chat and, and, and answer it if you can. What does the iodine do when you pour it? So, so here's your negative. You just came out of the watt. You, you developed it. You washed it. You fixed it and you washed it. And now you're standing there with a cup of iodine in your hand and you're pouring that dilute iodine on the surface of that plate. What does that do? Can anybody answer that? What does that iodine do? And this will this will address uh, Christer's question as we kind of, I'll throw questions back at, at you and kind of walk through that. What does the iodine do? Uh-oh, we have crickets. I'm going to wait for a second, though, and see if somebody will chime in here. It's it's in the book. I know you probably haven't gotten to it yet, but it's in the book. No, no takers on the iodine, huh? That's okay. The iodine, that dilute solution of iodine, you're pouring it on what? You're pouring it on the plate that's covered with silver. Right? That's what your image is made out of, the pure metallic silver, reduction of the iron, pure metallic silver. Yes, exactly. It be, it forms a very, very slight, tiny, baby, thin, it's called rehalog rehalogenation. Iodine on pure metallic silver creates silver iodide. That's it. That's what it does. It creates a somewhat silver iodide, right? Very weak. And it also... If you think about it this way, it kind of opens up uh, the silver to take on the staining of the pyro. So what's most important? I would probably say the, the most critical, Krister, is your iodine application. Number one, you want to have it the right color. You don't want a bunch of staining. If you can avoid that, it's, it's best. But you want to have it the right color. Flow it on. Let it let it exhaust its color that the highlights will go a little gray purple on your plate and once you tilt that plate and that water's clear that means all the iodine is absorbed into that silver transform that silver then you put it under water you pour water on it it'll look greasy just like under development right that's that's resisting that silver's resisting that water oil and water so to speak and once that that greasiness stops you can take it and expose it to some bright uv light that'll actually add a little density i do this with students here Say, so, okay, look at the density. Sometimes I'll even have them get their phone out and do a snap of it in the white pan. We go through the iodine, bring it out, expose it to a little bit of sun, and come back in, put it in the pan, and photograph it again. And there's sometimes there's a half a stop or even three quarters of a stop of density gain there. It's it's incredible. So now you've got the iodine, it's cleaned off. You didn't wash too much of it off because you want to capture, you want to have the pyro stain that, right? But you want to wash enough off so you don't have these weird red stain. It doesn't matter. They, they don't show in the prints anyway. But um, the perfect balance is to have a nice, clean, clear plate um, after iodine redevelopment. This is this is this is redeveloped. Um, then you pour the pyrogalic acid. What is pyrogalic acid? Pyrogalic acid is a stainer. It, it really it, it, that's what it does. Is it stains? And then you put a few drops of silver nitrate to your liking into that pyro. And that that's silver, right? That's going to jump on that those existing little voids that, or those, those openings that you've created with the uh, iodine. And so you're going to do two things. You're going to stack some silver and you're going to stain it. So when you stain it and stack it, it's going to be hard to have any light come through there and show up. But as the silver gets thinner, you're going to have all those tonal ranges all the way down to clear glass. That's why it's really important that you don't, you, those void areas, those clear glass areas have no, no developed silver in them, zero. Because once you start redeveloping, you're just going to plug everything up. So watch that. Um, I do talk a little bit about um, uh, it's some of the recipe changes here. Um, one of them, and I'm surprised no one brought this up, is I've increased my pyrogalic acid um, from one gram to a, to a liter to four grams and the citric acid to eight grams. <clears throat> uh, Krista says, sometimes to redevelop went uneven. Uh, explain that. What do you mean? One area got more dense than the other? Is that what you're saying? One area accepted and stained and built that silver and staining in one area more than other? That could be that could be exactly what I was talking about. That could be you may have washed 
the iodine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, all you have to do is be a little more consistent and don't wash too much, right? You iodine it, let it soak in, drip it off. And then we're only talking maybe 15 seconds, 20 seconds under running water. And then you have all the iodine is evenly distributed on the silver on the plate and the void areas or clear areas don't have any. And then when you, you go to redevelop, you'll have the same density built. You won't have, it won't be resistant over here and take it all over, he, over here, right? It'll be all consistent throughout. So the, the fox jaw will take as, as much as the stems and then a little different density in the thistles and that you want to see all that stuff. And then of course, absolute clear glass, you know, in the void areas, clear glass. You want to see your thumb through there. Those bullet holes are perfect. So yes, work on, work on more uniformity of that. Uh, it's an interesting question you asked because yes, you probably overwash. I agree. I agree. That's what most people do. Um, don't overwash it and yet don't underwash it, but you're probably better off actually underwashing it. You might get some red um, iodine stains, but they won't show up on the print. It'll make your negative just look kind of reddish and not, not weird, but just, yeah. The perfect scenario is that you take the right amount of that excess off and leave the right amount to take on the stain and the silver. Yeah, that's, that's very common. So in a nutshell, a negative is a properly exposed photograph to make printing out process prints, printing out paper prints, right? So printing out are all contact printed. Usually, not always, obviously, usually silver chloride prints. And in the book, you see chapter 12, I've got five variations of pot prints there. Um, yes, good question. Why did, it, why did you increase the pyro and citric? Great question, um, Krister. And this goes back to having student after student after student. I adjust my recipes and my techniques and my methodologies based on the students that come through my workshops. I see, I see where the strong areas are and I see where we're mostly concentrating on the weaker areas. One of the weaker areas, uh, it's, it's difficult for people to see those staining changes with a one gram per one liter, that's you know one-tenth of a percent of solution. It's really difficult for them to see the changes on the plate quickly enough. So, and it'd take 200, 300 mils sometimes, 150 mils sometimes to get through it. Then I started looking in the old literature again, and man, some of those old boys had cranked this stuff up to, they'd go 1%, 10 grams in a liter of, of cyanide, or I, I mean, um, <laughs> cyanide, um, <laughs> pyrogalic acid. And the citric acid is just following suit. You know, acids are restrainers, so we want the same thing here. We want to control that. So I had to increase the citric acid or the restrainer along with the stainer. Um, but bottom line is faster, more efficient. And it doesn't seem, I made many, 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 many negatives redeveloped with this strong and even stronger. I don't want to go any stronger than this. Sometimes you get close on a negative and you pour a 30 or 40 mil cup out there and you're, I've ran up to 1.5%. It's a solution, uh, pyro in it, and it just it'll it'll go so fast. It's it's just too strong. So I found a balance. I felt before I was too weak. It took too long, and people were a little confused about it. Uh, and then I think I found my what they call the Goldilocks uh, area, right? Perfect. Not too big. Not too small. Not too cold. Not too hot. Just right. Yes. Um, you know. <laughs> I just did an interview a couple of weeks ago with uh, a good guy named Andy. He's out of the UK. Uh, he has flogger.co.uk, flogger.co.uk. If you go there, or you, you can see it around. I posted a couple of places. I did a long interview with him, and we were talking about learning the process. And I told him, you know, this is my kind of vitae. I give him my little resume spiel and how many people I've, I've been around and taught and how much experience I've gained from that. And then I then I say, you know, I can't teach people this process. I, there's, I can't teach you this process. It's, it's impossible. What I can do is give you tools. So if you're motivated enough, you can learn it and, and perfect it on your own. I think I give you enough tools uh, that you can do that here. I really do. 
Um, cause I've, I've heard it. I have, I get these wonderful emails every once in a while that just lift my spirits. It just, it's just really incredibly important to put so much work in this stuff. And, and yeah, it's great. It, it, uh, the support is wonderful. It's unbelievable, but it's always nice to hear that, man, you know, I got your book. I watch your videos and, and look at what I'm doing. This is incredible. And it's true. That's that. So when people say I learned from this person, or I learned from that person. I mean, I'm not saying don't say you didn't do a workshop with me. If you did, of course, say that. But um, if you want. But but if you've been out on your own a while, you don't need I. I'm not looking. I'm not looking for any of that. I don't need anyone to justify what I'm doing. You learned this process. You're the one that spent the resources and the time. I gave you the tools, or I'm one of the people that gave you the tools. Maybe who knows? But it's really interesting when people say they've learned this from someone, especially a process like this. You can't learn this from someone. You have to teach yourself this process. You can get guidance and get help and get ideas from people. But you surely you can't hang your hat on, you know, Quinn Jacobson or some some other person uh, teaching this process because we're just <clears throat> well, let me speak for myself. I'm just trying to take the very the most difficult areas that I struggled with learning this process myself, and I'm trying to translate them into a consumable, practical and uh, repeatable process for you. So you can look at the book, read the book, go watch the video and say, hey, I can try that. I know my safety. I know how to handle this. I know my time periods. And now I'm trying to come back in every week and kind of clean up here and try to, like Krister, he had great questions today. I, I absolutely appreciate that. Um, come in here and, and, and really refine and get down in the weeds with you and refine some of these ideas that I've put out uh, in the book. Yes, absolutely, Krister. I remember you very well, my friend, very well. I remember Paris in 2012, making positives and negatives, and we're just uh, we're just still rocking this world. Five years? Is it five? No, oh my God, seven years? Krister, I'm getting too old. Time's going too fast. <laughs> I told you guys this before. Um, I have... My dark room and studio will be broken down November, middle of November, something like that. So, ooh, two months, about two, two and a half months. Um, um, I'm breaking down the studio. Everything's coming down and going to be packed away and stored. We are selling our home next March, February or March. And by the summertime, I hope to be on the mountain. And then by the fall, I hope to be living in my new place that we build over the next summer. So I'm going offline. You'll see. I don't know. I shouldn't say that. Maybe I won't go. I won't go completely offline. But I won't have this time. I'm I'm going to be a house builder next year. So my dark room, my studio, all my camera gear, my blacksmith shop, my bladesmith shop, everything's getting broken down. And I'll reappear sometime in 2021, somewhere in there. And by 2022-ish, somewhere in there, we're going to offer um, residencies, 10-day uh, residencies to come up to the mountain. I'm going to have a place to stay over the studio, over the darkroom area, uh, two places to stay, private little areas, eat out of the greenhouse, play around on the land. I'm going to have archery and pistol and rifle ranges and knife throwing and um, all kinds of fun stuff to do. Do a complete digital detox up there, right? So I have a few people already very interested in that. Um, that's my goal. So I come out of the city life or the suburban life, move to the mountains, reset set this all back up again. I'm going to have a similar setup as I do now. It'll just be organized a little bit better. I love it. I mean, I have plenty of space and room, but um, Life is getting tough. Life is getting weird. The world's going crazy. And I don't, I don't share that optimism a lot of people share about the future. So I'm going to try to prepare myself to withstand whatever climate's coming, whatever food or water crisis is coming, whatever political crisis is coming. I'm going to try to prepare myself and my family a little bit for that. And just really be self, more self-sustaining, have privacy, have a little bit more freedom. 
um, you know, I like to do crazy stuff outside all the time. So those are the plans. So I'm glad you guys are joining me now uh, while we have some time together. And uh, and I hope, I hope uh, some of you will be encouraged and motivated to come and join me on the mountain in a couple, three years. It's going to be an amazing experience. I really look forward to it. No, Pat, I don't recommend people working in web. In fact, I, I prefer that you don't. <laughs> I can teach you all my bad habits. No, I try. what I try to do is I try to give people, I try to teach people to be self-sufficient in the process, how to mix their chemistry, how to store it, how to keep it right, uh, development te uh, techniques and, and um, um, those really difficult things like trying to describe how to tie your shoelaces over the phone if you've never done it. I try to show you how to do those here and build those good techniques. So when you go home and you start doing it on your own, you, I've, I've had people come and they've developed bad techniques or bad habits. And it's kind of tough to break those sometimes. And some of them are kind of dangerous. You have to, you have to really watch that. Um, yes, Chris, or we'd love to have you. Come, yes. 2022 trick. That would be, you guys wait until you see this. I, I will do videos on it and I'll show you my property and I'll show you the beautiful wildlife. It looks like a national park. I can't believe that I have 12 acres of land in the Rocky Mountains that looks like a national park. I'm not kidding you. It's so beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. So quiet, so peaceful. We were up the other day meeting a, we got some, this long, long driveway coming in off this dirt road. We're on top of a mountain. And I need my lot leveled and I need this driveway kind of squared away. And while we were waiting for, for him, Janie, my wife said, look, and I looked down the meadow there and there's this beautiful Rocky Mountain fox, black tipped ears and white tipped tail. And he's just looking around there. He's so interested in stuff. He picks something up and throws it out of his mouth. And then he, he goes up the mountain. And we walked up the mountain, came down and came down the other side where he was. And I looked down there and there's a bunch of mule deer track. So he was probably trying to check out uh, some mule deer. So yes, Borat Patterson, Paolo. So are you going to live in nature just like Borat Petterlin? I don't know what, what that is. I don't know what he does, but if he lives in nature, I guess so. I'm going to live on top of a mountain in the Rocky Mountains. I'm going to have my blacksmith shop, my bladesmith shop, my studio, my North Lit uh, studio. Build a, I'm going to build a beautiful studio and dark room. Above the dark room is going to be mezzanine floor with two people, two private rooms. And my house is going to be attached to that. And off to the side will be a greenhouse, a large greenhouse to grow food in. I'm going to have a goat shed and a chicken coop and maybe some bees. So if Borat Patterlin is doing that, I guess so. Yep. I don't know what that is or who that is. So, wait. Uh, oh, I do know. I, did, does he, I thought he lived in... Eastern Europe somewhere. I didn't know he lived in the woods. So yes, that's going to be a, that's going to be a great uh, thing happening. And I'm going to try to do these every week for this couple months that I have a uh, few months that I have left. If we have things to talk about, um, I'm just going to do them this way. Just come in. Uh, when you see me go live, I'm going to try to do them for an hour. Come in and uh, say hi, get your questions. Think about questions you want to ask this week. Um, and, uh, come on in and ask me some questions, get, get, uh, get some perspective on what, uh, how I do, uh, maybe some things through this book. I know people have had a lot of questions in the book and I, I, I answer them by email too, but I think it's great to be able to share them. So Borat lives in Slovenia. Okay. Not in nature. <laughs> okay. There you go. I don't, I have no idea. Um, <clears throat> so next week. Uh, come with your questions. I'm going to actually go into um, some of the chemistry next week on negatives. So if you look um, on, you know, uh, chapter 11, uh, we're going to go over uh, uh, page 132 next week. We'll do one page 132, and I'll I'll answer questions. I'll talk about why the recipe is different for making negatives and how you approach that methodology, and um, uh, talk about some results that you can expect to get out of uh, following the, this methodology. So is there anything else? I'm going to get out of here. Um, 
I got to get back out to my bladesmith shop. I'm going to finish that railroad spike knife. So thanks, guys. Thank you for visit coming in. I hope uh, I hope um, can can you have a session about so sure. What do, what do you want to do about silver bath, Krista? I'm I'm happy wherever you guys want to go. I'm happy to do it. Thank you, Marcus. I appreciate your support. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate your support very much. I, I appreciate that. And Tony, 28, thumbs up to you, brother. Yeah, tell me what you want to do about the silver bath. Do you, are you talking about maintenance or do you want to talk about? Thank you, Pat. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to do whatever I can. I appreciate you coming in and spending some time with it. You know, we spend time in everybody else's world, right? We're reading a book. We're watching a show. We're at a play or whatever we're doing, right? You're listening to me. You're spending time in my world. So I appreciate that. Anytime people give up their time or money, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, for not, uh, phenomena, as you started to touch. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I'm happy to do, I'm happy to do silver bath. If you can formulate some more specific questions for next week and bring them in. And if you can, if you can come, I know a lot of Europeans are on holiday in August. Um, and traveling. But if you can bring them in next week, I will uh, definitely address those for sure. Shooting nature. Oh, okay. Yeah. Does he shoot? Yeah. You know what? I think I included him in a show in Northern, Color uh, Northern Colorado University here that I, that I um, um, oversaw a few years ago. Yes. Send me an email. Send me an email. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much for spending time in my world. And uh, I appreciate that very much. We'll see you next Sunday. Ciao.